Yaying is fun. <laughs> Super fun. We are live. It says, you're live. Hi, live. Mine still says two people waiting. I don't understand. Oh, now we get people watching. Okay, cool. Four concurrent viewers. Hi, viewers. <laughs> Since I cannot pronounce words today. I cannot words today. Good day for that. You can't even. I can't even. <laughs> oh, this one could get long. Just, just going to say that right now. We should probably get started then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Should uh, we push buttons? We can push buttons. All right. Yeah, I'm good. Three, two, one. I feel like this could be a long one, Mike. <laughs> it could be. This is uh, going to be a fun topic, though. I can't wait to dive in here. Yeah, and I know that like you've had, you've had early access to this book, so I know that you've got a little bit of a leg up on me on this one. But I did finish it almost a week early, so I've had a little bit of time with it as well. So maybe we'll be on even footing with that. However, before we can get into the thing that everybody wants us to get into this time around, uh, we got some follow-up to do, Mike. And, we uh, do. And uh, I, d I don't really want to talk about follow-up this time around. <laughs> Why is that? As you would expect, uh, two reasons. One, I didn't do either one of mine. And oh, come on. I know, I know, I know. But two, like I really didn't want to do one of the two. So then that that yeah. Yes. Bad things bad things happened. Oh so, come on. I know, right? I was going to share my eulogy with six different people this week, you being one of them, and nobody else did it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. So this is this is partly because I if I only had a brain. Good job, Blake. I I think that part of this is that I I had a lot of time set aside to do both of mine. One of was to write my eulogy. The other one was to create my daily plan type thingy, which is like the printable daily whatever piece of paper. And yep. I ended up I this this was somewhat caught me off guard. Uh, I ended up taking last week off of work, so I wasn't around computers, like, at all. So that meant that I had, like, an entire week's worth of stuff that I didn't get done. So it happens. But on the positive note, I built a treehouse for our girls, which is super fun. <laughs> nice job. Yeah, telephone poles in the ground, treehouse in the air. Awesome. Super fun. Very big. Very exciting. Okay, my failures have been talked about. Can we can we talk about your stuff? Hopefully yours isn't as bad as mine. Talk about my failures instead. <laughs> I said stuff. I didn't say failures. Sure, sure. <laughs> no. So the ask what if, this was really just trying to get myself to think bigger. Uh, what if basically I was able to do anything that I wanted to do if failure wasn't an option what would that look like for me and i feel like that kind of manifested itself in my eulogy which i've gone back and forth on this but whether i wanted to read it on air or not i think i'm going to just because uh, i want other people to do this i found the whole exercise very uh, rewarding so i'll share that in a second okay the other one was what elements of my story do i want to make normal for my kids and as i started thinking about this I realized that all the elements of my story that I want to make normal are kind of expressed through the core values that we've identified. So all of the individual things, I even shared some examples in the last episode of like the one-on-ones that I do with my kids. I want that to become a normal part of my story that my kids choose to implement in their own families when they have the opportunity. The uh, We have this thing at church after prayer, I have a different handshake I do with each one of my, my kids. They've all got their own like special handshake. You know, we do line them up and do them, do them all one right after the other, just as like a way to make 
prayer a, a fun thing, you know? And so there's lots of stuff like that, which as I was thinking about those things, I realized that the specifics there, the actual activities aren't as important as the values that they're based on. And if I really instill the values, then the activities take care of themselves. It's kind of like lead versus lag measures for sure. personal stuff. So I didn't spend a whole lot of time on that one. All right, enough dilly-dallying. Here's the eulogy. You ready for this? Hit me. All right. Now, this was uh, interesting timing, by the way, because as I was working on this this week, uh, my wife's grandmother passed away. So we went to a funeral and heard a eulogy and got the little brochure thing with the thing printed on the back. Yep. Yep. So I had a, a real-life example <laughs> to go off of, uh, and I realize looking at that that there were that shaped how mine uh how mine finished up but it also uh, highlighted things of a standard eulogy that i wanted to to change so here we go mike schmitz was a loving husband to his wife rachel and ever-present father to toby joshua jonathan malachi and adelaide family was his first ministry and he always made sure to put them first he frequently said no to work and business opportunities to spend time and go on adventures with the people that he valued most Mike was a committed member of his church. When he wasn't spending time with his family, he could often be found serving there. He believed that God had blessed him richly, and he gave generously of his time and treasure to those who had need. Mike's life was driven by a desire to be a good steward of what was entrusted to him by God. He desired to inspire, encourage, and teach others to connect to their calling, discover their destiny, and live a life they were created for. Everything he did was filtered through his life theme, and he helped others to accept responsibility, gain clarity, and take action in living a purpose-driven and meaningful life. He was an entrepreneur who loved building businesses and making art. Before he died, he wrote several New York Times best-selling books and gave away over $10 million. There's the thinking bigger part. <laughs> nice. He taught his kids to be lifelong learners and discover their own creativity. They've all followed in his footsteps as creative entrepreneurs who, li who live life on their own terms. Well done, sir. Think? The only, The only thing... There's only one point that stood out to me that I was like, hmm, that seems odd, um, <laughs> was the $10 million piece. And it, the only reason I say that is not because of the thinking big piece. It's just the, mm -hmm. okay, why does that need to be in there? Because just from, from my perspective, if giving away $10 million is something that you want to aspire towards, my guess is that at some point you're probably going to reach the mindset where you really don't want people to know about it. That's fair. Yeah. So, so that, that number really means nothing other than it's unattainable for me right now. <laughs> sure. Sure. It just seems odd from, I'm looking at this perspective of this is your public publish in the pamphlet at your funeral perspective. Right. Uh, I, I don't know that I would put it in that, However, that said, having a personal eulogy that is not shared publicly, this would be spot on. Like, I, I could totally exactly. see that. So this is not actually intended to be shared right. publicly. I feel like some of the stuff in Donald Miller's example, there were some specific things in there. He didn't have a specific number in terms of how much money he made or gave away or something like that. But uh, I, I put it in there just because I want to give more than I take. Yep. And I picked a number that was absurd <laughs> that would force my world to be drastically different in order for me to hit it, right? Sure. So, yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't want this exact thing printed in uh, <laughs> in, a, in a paper that's handed out at my actual yeah. funeral. Yeah. But uh, I, as I read through it, though, that's also one of the more exciting or motivating parts of it for me. So I feel like it does its its job. And uh, I, again, I probably, I don't know, an argument could be made that this was never meant to be read out loud, but I want other people to do this. So I, I shared it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's spot on. I, I'm glad that you went through it. I, I'm going to do my best to make sure I've got mine done by the time we talk next. So I'm not, discarding the two action items that I completely failed on just because I took the week off. Like I just need to get it going again. Like, 
and today's sure. book's going to give me more action items, so this is the way things go, right? Um, it will. So anyway, well done. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty solid eulogy, I would say. Hey, thanks. So, unless there's something else we need to chit-chat about before we get into a potentially long episode here, uh, we should jump into this one. Uh, this is Today's book is Building a Second Brain by Tiago Forte. And I have to say there are a lot, well, there's a lot of buzz about this book right now. And part of me thinks that that's partially because of the size of Tiago's audience and just him being able to do that sort of thing. Uh, at the same time, it's also, this book has a lot of uh, a promise behind it that is pretty solid as well. So because of those two, I think it, it ends up elevating it quite high in the marketing and buzz worlds. So some of that's probably justified. Some of it, like, hmm, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> so we'll see how this, uh, how this episode goes. Uh, I'm, but... I'm actually going to... Uh, gonna push back on that a little bit, I think, in terms of like the size of the audience that Tiago has. Maybe he has more influence than I realize, but when I think about building a second brain and compare it to something like Atomic Habits by James Clear, I feel like James Clear was starting at a point where he was much further ahead than Tiago was. And what I have seen from following both of those journeys fairly closely, it feels like Tiago's is accelerating faster than James Clear's was. And I think that is partly maybe in terms of the promise of the whole building a second brain idea. Uh, partly he's got a potentially very resonating message. <laughs> I think the uh, quick trajectory that we've seen with this is an indication that uh, separating it from the, the book that we're about to discuss, that the idea itself is very important to people right now. Yeah, and I, I think that's the latter part of what I was saying, like the the, the concept of what he has Correct. is striking a chord uh, as opposed to the size of the, the audience. I mean, he does have, from my perspective, he does have a pretty large following. Uh, I wouldn't say it's on the James Clear level. It's certainly not like Tim Ferriss level or Joe Rogan level. Like we're not talking about that size uh but size enough that you you send out a few newsletters and you've got a few thousand copies sold like at that scale he's definitely there so that sometimes is all it takes to start creating that buzz uh as long as there's a little bit of authenticity involved and there's some truth behind what you're promoting right there has to be some yep. element there that's that's the part i want to try to flush out today is is how does this concept of a second brain the promise of a second brain as the introduction is here uh how does how does that impact us maybe maybe specifically you and i mike uh but also the the general digital world in general because i know that that's essentially we're going to be talking about pkms a lot today i, I think that's pretty <laughs> obvious uh so just what are the ramifications of that and why is that needed? So there's, there's a lot of that discussion uh, that's going to come out here. So we'll see uh, cool. See how it goes. Uh, all right. That all said, the introduction uh, starts us off with the promise of a second brain. Basically, what are you going to get out of this? And it's kind of a, why should you do this? And he has... Uh, a f I think, is it just the one list? Yeah, there is a list in here uh, that the the building a second brain, which you should know building a second brain started, maybe you should speak to this. It started as a video course or like a cohort. Is it a cohort or a video course? I think it's kind of both. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't know exactly how it started. I do remember seeing it show up though as a $99 course. Yes. Back in the day. It is far uh, from that, that might now. might have been... <laughs> yeah, it is much more expensive now. Uh, I have actually gone through it, and I can recommend it. I have things that I disagree with in the system itself, which I'm sure we will talk about. Yep. But I will say that 
the course itself that Tiago has put together is very, very good. Um, he has, at this point, I think 15 or 16 different cohorts that he's done. So he's got a whole bunch of alumni, and they come in and they present some guest sessions on how they've Im implemented it in different tools and things like that, which is a pretty genius approach. Um, it's expensive, like I said. And I think for most people who are listening to this episode, if you're unsure about building a second brain, the place to start is absolutely going to be to read this book first. That being said, if you are convinced that building a second brain might be for you and you're just hesitating uh, based on the, the high price tag, uh, you get out of these sorts of courses, what you put into it, but I can put my stamp of approval on, on this one uh, and I would recommend it, but it is going to be intensive and it's going to take some work. Yeah. I, I know that it started out much cheaper. If you do some digging online and try to figure out, uh, is it worth it or not? You'll run across articles and forums and stuff where people have talked about like, Hey, yeah, I did this, but it was $200 when I did it. And now it's 800. I don't know where it's at right now. Uh, so it's, it's more than 800. <laughs> it's not cheap. I know that. Uh, so anyway, that said the beginning of this book in the introduction, he's basically spelling out why, why a second brain, uh, and, and what is it that you're going to get out of this? Uh, honestly, a lot of it from, from my perspective, if I had to distill this down, it, it has to do with being able to find things quickly like just raw facts that you've collected. Uh, and maybe the, the other side of that is being able to process your thoughts ahead of time, right? Again, this is probably your territory. Interesting that I'm leading this. Uh, but to me, it's, it's one, collecting, the, collecting things quickly, finding things quickly, but then processing your thoughts ahead of time. Thus, the thinking part of this and trying to get things out of your head, the second brain, quote unquote, like that's where that's starting to come from. So you're externalizing thoughts and thinking so that you have something to reference later that you can then process. What do you want to add to that, Mike? Sounds good to me. Okay. <laughs> I figured it would. <laughs> so let's, let's jump into the, the book itself. Uh, surprise, surprise. Guess what? It's three parts. Introduction, three parts, plus a bonus chapter. Did you do the bonus chapter, Mike? I realized when you put the outline together that uh, I did not. <laughs> the pre-release one didn't have it, and I didn't bother to go read the the hardcover one that showed up in the mail. So I completely missed the section. Huh. That being said, I have thoughts on the uh, the tagging itself. Okay. So so that'll be a fun one-sided conversation. Uh, that I'll, I'll I'll do my best well, to relay I mean, what if he. You, if you want to open this this can of worms right now, uh, I will say the the issues that I have with this is that he doesn't really talk about the bidirectional linking in apps like Obsidian and Rome and Craft and stuff like that. So I view tagging as just another way to organize things, just like folders, just like bidirectional links. Like when you use all these things together, you can achieve some cool results. I have no interest in how specifically you want me to do this per para. So uh, I will say that. What you just described, as far as like tagging as a way to find things, that is what he recommends you don't do. Mm -hmm. So that's not what he wants you to do with them. We'll get into that. That'll be fun. Yep. We'll, we'll get there. Uh, I suppose you probably know his viewpoint on that, even though you didn't read it, but yes. Um, <laughs> so let's, let, let's jump into part one here, which is the foundation. And I didn't list all the chapters in the outline because I didn't want to follow the chapters exactly. So the three chapters, as I work my way there, are where it all started, what is a second brain, and how a second brain works. And the first chapter of those, where it all started, which, by the way, I noticed the very beginning, it, he does what a lot of people do with nonfiction books. He's got quotes at the very beginning of the chapters. And the very mm -hmm. first quote is by none other than David Allen of getting things done fame, your mind is for having ideas, not holding them, which is probably one of David Allen's most commonly uh, quoted phrases, I guess. So mm -hmm. yes, interesting that he started out there. Uh, but anyway, he tells a story about how he suddenly experienced pain, like physical pain, and then it became unexplained as far as where it was coming from. And he goes through this whole thing of like trying to figure out where it is and ultimately lands on the process of writing things down. 
getting things out of his head so that he can then see them all and try to make connections between them. And to summarize the, the end of the story there, it works. It helps him find ways to help alleviate the pain and get healthier. Uh, again, not going to go into the details there, but the, the point he's trying to make is like externalizing things and writing things down is ultimately what led him to having success in coming up with the ideas in what to do from there. Thus, second brains are important. That's what he's, that's <laughs> what he's telling us. So on, uh, to summarize his health issues, this is in my, my node file, but pain in his throat was only treated by anti-seizure medication. And one of the side effects of that medication was severe short-term memory loss and a numbing sensation throughout the body. So pretty, pretty severe side effects. Uh, what he did is he asked for his complete patient file and he started digitizing everything, which started, then started to manage his health with some different lifestyle changes. So building a second brain, the whole idea was born out of a season of pain and trying to find a solution to a very real physical problem that he was dealing with. I feel like that's the best way to start this, this story, you know? Yeah. Uh, the, a lot of, a lot of people try uh, a lot of the productivity books that we read, a lot of the gurus that create the systems, they try to make it, they, they try to, make this thing that's generally applicable to all these different people. Um, but how they start the explanation of the, how they arrived at that system is, is really important to me. If it's not born out of you solving a problem that you had yourself, if you're just trying to answer a problem that you see somewhere else, but you haven't had to wrestle through it yourself, I got no time for you. Uh, but this is a very authentic, I feel a very vulnerable start. I had uh, Tiago Forte on the Focus podcast and he talked about this. I uh, wasn't sure how comfortable he was going to be talking live about the specific things that he had struggled with, but um, he was very open and, and honest about it. So uh, I have a lot of respect for him as a, a person, and uh, I, I feel this is a, a very good introduction to the whole concept. Um, you have my attention and you have authority in my eyes to speak to this at, at this point. Oh, other thing regarding David Allen. There's actually a David Allen blurb, I think, on the, the back of the book cover, maybe. And I think building a second brain probably has a lot of similarities to GTD. It feels kind of like GTD for the modern age. <laughs> um, that's very general, and I'm sure there's places where that analogy falls down, but uh, I feel like building a second brain now is maybe what GTD was 20 years ago. Yeah, that, that might be true. I know that, again, if you do some digging on this online, there's there's quite a few folks. There's, there's obviously people on both sides of the fence, people who will say building a second brain is terrible and you should never have anything to do with it. Uh, and, and there are folks who say, like, this changed my life and it's what everybody should do. Like, there's obviously people on both sides of the fence. Same thing with GTD. Same deal. Um, but there's, there are quite a few folks who talk about how this has so many similarities and connections to GTD. Like it has a lot of the same uh, methodologies uh, behind it if you look at the core philosophies and not the technicals. So like that's what they're getting at. Now, having gone through this and, and reading the book on it, like I can see where they're making that point and there are elements of it. Yes, that's true, but... And I've said this for a while, there are a lot of elements of GTD that are just natural human actions. Like it's not something that David Allen invented and, and proposed and then people adopted and it became a big deal. He was simply acknowledging something that people do naturally. Uh, thus like his natural planning model. So like stuff like that comes about. Now, I don't like the whole of GTD. You know, we, we've talked about that. Uh, but at the same time, I think you and I would both agree we don't necessarily like the whole of building a second brain either. Uh, just from the quick interactions you and I have had, I would assume you're putting on that. But maybe I'm putting words in your mouth. But <laughs> yes. Anyway, let's let's keep going here. What is a second brain is the second chapter. And this in this, he gives us kind of a history, I guess, of like this isn't something new. Like, a lot of times when people see this or talk about BASB, 
they they will refer to things like para uh, now code and then also like this is a new concept well no he he takes us back and it's like okay no this this is something that people have done for a long time uh in the concept of like commonplace books or just notebooks in general uh, people have grabbed onto the collection of ideas and tried to find ways to organize those so it's it's not a new thing you know trying to externalize things anyone who has worked in the world of knowledge work like this is definitely something that you're doing somehow and it, it's something that more and more people are needing to do because more and more people are working in the world of knowledge as opposed to being welders and pipe fitters plumbers electricians and such like there's not as many people in those trades which is a separate issue altogether like I just threw something on the floor and i don't know what it was super fun uh, so anyway, there's a whole bunch, like, there's a whole other issue of people not being in those trades. I know there's a shortage of that, but at the same time, like we work in knowledge, like this is, this is something we need to, uh, think about doing is how do we collect our own ideas? How do we process them? How do we think ahead, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I like the part in this chapter about the commonplace book. The, uh, commonplace book is something that I had heard about before but I never really understood the history of it. Interestingly, in the Mac Power Users Forum, there's a whole bunch of people who are complaining at the moment about <laughs> Tiago's use of the commonplace book and how it really started somewhere else. Okay. And I just kind of laugh at those those comments, like, whatever, congratulations. <laughs> Maybe you're technically right. Yep. <laughs> who cares? <laughs> A commonplace book, as Tiago defines it, is a place to connect bits of information from other sources. And I think that's a really cool idea. I had been doing that for a long time inside of day one. I was using it not just for journaling, but I was using it to collect quotes that I wanted to keep. I was building a database of these quotes that I wanted to remember. And when he talks about the second brain being a digital commonplace book, and he gave a couple of specific examples that he used it for, like a study notebook, a personal journal, a sketchbook for new ideas. I mean, those are the ones that resonated with me. I mean, yeah, that's basically how I'm, how I'm using Obsidian at the moment. Uh, but I never really considered Obsidian to be a second brain just because the, everything that goes along with building a second brain, and this isn't Tiago's fault, but I feel like a lot of people have latched onto a surface level understanding of some article that he wrote and they're like, Oh yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. I know all about that second brain stuff. You don't need to talk to me about that anymore. And if I'm Tiago, I'm really frustrated because I'm like, no, you don't get it. <laughs> like you understood the technical process for progressive summarization or something. And you decided that it wasn't for you and you just wrote off the entire idea without getting to understand what it really means. And so the whole idea of a commonplace book at the beginning here, this resonates this i feel kind of sets the stage like building a second brain the, the second brain could be anything that you want it could be one specific bucket for this type of thing that you want to collect and if that's all it was then you've got a second brain you don't have to manage everything out of a single app which is kind of how i think some people think about it he also does a really good job of articulating the pain points the average us employee spends 76 hours uh, 76 hours per year, I think. I missed the, the term there. Looking for misplaced notes, items, or files. And 26% of a typical knowledge worker's day is looking for and consolidating information across systems. So much wasted yep. time. For what? <laughs> <laughs> and this this also kind of speaks to what kind of information are you trying to manage? Are you trying to manage all the information? which is what I saw a lot of people do with Evernote back in the day. Just dump it all in there. I mean, the, the even the logo, it's an elephant, right? Because an elephant never forgets anything. You've got yep. it in your system if you ever need to go back and find it. And I feel like that is selling the whole concept of a second brain a little bit short. Yeah, I think, you know, it's easy. We love to rip on Evernote. Anytime it, something along Evernote's lines comes up, at least I do, I love to rip on it. And it's not the tool though, it's how people use it. Correct, yes. So the the thing that at least I tend to overlook because it's more fun to rip on a tool like that uh, is that despite the fact that I think Evernote was regularly used incorrectly, I, 
I think it definitely opened the doors or helped us learn ways to operate with collecting collected information. Thus, we've been led to things like Rome Research and Obsidian and Notion and Craft and et cetera, et cetera. Like those tools have kind of built on what Evernote started. So I'm not going to give all the credit to Evernote by any means, but I think it's definitely a part of that puzzle and, and helping us to understand that, thus leading us to some of what Tiago Forte is telling us about here in, in this book. So it is still, I think it is still a tool that people can use well. You just got to be smart in how you do it. So yes, because doesn't Tiago still use it? I think he uses Evernote still. He does. Uh, I believe in the focus episode, he mentioned that he uh, doesn't like to use an app that's less than 10 years old. <laughs> okay, sure. Because <laughs> he wants it to be around for the long haul. Yeah. And I think that is a perfectly valid approach. I mean, Obsidian, even though it's been around for a couple of years now, is technically still in beta. They yep. could decide, you know what, there's no business model here. Let's shut it down. Let's go home. Yep. At that point, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully they open source it and you and i can take over and start <laughs> running with it <laughs> yeah yeah there's there's other there's definitely other options at this point i, I consider this to be the golden age for note-taking apps there's a lot of really cool things a lot of really interesting things that are uh are possible now and uh it's kind of interesting it's like modern note-taking apps built on a very old technology yep. markdown files plain text <laughs> right but what you can do with those plain text files is it's kind of kind of mind blowing when you think about it. Yep. Especially if you learn shell scripting, Mike. You should do that. I would love to see you write a shell script. <laughs> I'd be very excited to run it the first time. Well, maybe I wouldn't. Maybe I wouldn't do that. That might be a bad idea. It'd be it might fun to be watch a bad though. Bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go into the third chapter here cuz we haven't even made it to the meat of this. Uh, how a second brain works. And I, I think we'll, we'll, as we go through part two, I think we'll end up talking about like some of the technicals of what this could look like uh, or what a second brain looks like. But uh, in, this, in this section, at least the part that stood out to me is he, he, he talks about like the superpowers of a second brain. And that there's four that, that he works through. One is making our ideas concrete. So because you're externalizing things and you have things somewhere that you can process it, it becomes something more long-term. So it's, it's something you can build off of. So making our ideas concrete, revealing new association between ideas. So because you have them externalized, you can now start to have them pop up in places where you wouldn't expect them, thus new associations between different areas. Uh, the third one, incubating our ideas over time. Again, because you have it external, it can come back up later, like 10 years later, and then start to process it and distill it quite a bit more. Uh, and then the last one, sharpening our unique perspectives. That's kind of what I was talking about early on is how if you're able to externalize your thoughts, you've now created a way for you to process your own ideas and thinking ahead of time. And then when you're in a conversation, kind of like what you and I are having, Mike, uh, you kind of know what you think already. So then when someone asks you a question, there's not this, well, I don't know. I don't know what I'm thinking about that. Or you, you say something or a phrase or a, a, a monologue of sorts trying to pass the time because you haven't processed it. Instead, you've already thought through some of those ideas. So then you can speak intelligently about it instead of you know putting off the question as people will do sometimes in interviews when I go off script. Super fun <laughs> to do that. <laughs> So, yes, uh, these are the four superpowers. What do you want to add to that? I would just add that in the situation that you described about thinking about something ahead of time and deciding what you really think, the real value of this is not in predicting those moments and being ready for every possible scenario, but recognizing when you get asked one of those questions and you don't have a good answer, being like, huh, I should figure that out. And valuing figuring it out enough to... And to put some notes into your second brain as Tiago defines it. You know, as he's talking about these superpowers of a second brain, every single one of these I completely agree with. And if you would have given me this list prior to reading Building a Second Brain, I'd have been like, yes, 
that is what I believe. And then if you would ask me, so are you going to do building a second brand? You'd be like, no, not for me. <laughs> right. So I feel like I, for a long time, had a improper understanding of what this actually was. Um, but this is really just the creative process. I mean, all of these things have, I've kind of discovered over time through like steel, like an artist and all those conversations that we've, we've had about collecting and, and connecting dots and, and things like that. That's really what he's talking about here. And so I think there's a link between the whole second brain idea and creating, which is not explicitly seen. Uh, you first come across building a second brain and you, you probably think kind of like I did with Evernote back in the day. So it's a thing that I dump stuff in and then I never have to worry about being able to find something again. But that's not really it. It's really about what are you going to do with the quality, not the quantity of the things that you put into it. And the whole idea of incubating, that's interesting to me. For a long time, I, I actually described Obsidian as my greenhouse for my ideas, which I think fits that, that whole idea really well. Like you don't really even know what an idea is until you've given it some time and you've bounced it around in your brain and looked at this thing a few times and you can figure out different ways to connect it to some different things, but your brain is kind of doing that anyways. If you're reading all the books that we're reading and you're collecting all these, these different dots, your brain is going to start connecting some of these things in, in new and interesting ways automatically. But what's so fascinating to me about these connected notes apps is that graph and the ability to actually see for the first time, the types of connections that I believe my brain was making anyways. But now I can kind of, see it man i can see it externally it is my second brain in a sense but also i can influence it i can see the things that are there that i don't recognize there's a connection there in my brain and i can be inspired by that connection and i can formalize it with a couple of brackets and then i'm off to the races because you never know what that one connection what sort of chain reaction that is going to trigger but the ultimate goal has to be, I, I think, the, the output, the sharpening your unique perspective. How are you going to do that? I mean, it, it's, it can't just be enhancing your thinking. There's got to be some output associated with it, I believe, whether that's writing it down in a notebook or creating a blog post, recording a video, even if it's just the whole, I know you hate the idea of like the map of content, right? But that sort of idea, the workbench where you're playing with these things and deciding for yourself, what do I actually think about this? There's a, a lot of inspiration and revelation that comes from that process. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, as we, well, let's, let's keep going. Cause I, I think more of what I'm thinking about what you just said is going to come out as we, as we continue here. So let's, let's jump into part two. And in order to do that, I'm going to wrap up the last part of part one, because he introduces uh, this, framework called code. I think I mentioned that a little bit ago. Uh, code is an acronym that stands for capture, organize, distill, express. And the next four chapters in part two, each chapter is dedicated to one of those letters, one of those components. And the first one of those uh, is capture. The, the tagline on this is keep what resonates. And one thing that I, I haven't really I haven't really done in the past. Capture is one of those things that even to use that term makes me immediately think of GTD. Like I, I can't help that. It's just immediately what came to to mind. But one of the things that he calls out here uh, is that you don't necessarily need to capture everything. And, and this is, I think, maybe the, the deciding factor that differentiates this from what we all used to do in Evernote was just capture everything and all the things and put it all in one spot and hope you could find it later, right? In here, he has, like, he even has a, a section, what not to keep in this. And I'm not used to someone telling me that. Like, 
in the world of digital files, like it's easy to keep everything and never get rid of anything. So it's, it's yep. just interesting, like, okay, don't keep this, like get rid of this. So it, I'm not used to that. Uh, so anyway, that's a little bit refreshing to have someone take that perspective. Uh, there's more I want to say about this, but I'll pause because I, I think there's so many places you could go with this. Capture is a, an important piece because like that's the point at which you're grabbing the big thing to get it out of your head. Like that's your starting point, right? If you don't have that process super simple, it, it doesn't happen at all. I, I have this habit on my phone. I still do it today. Uh, w what's the number one thing people do before they lock their phone? Like it's pretty common. You'll swipe up and it takes you back to the home screen, right? Like that's the most common thing that people will do when they're closing their phone. Mine's a little bit different. I have drafts in the dock and my habit is to swipe up out of whatever app I'm in and tap that and lock it. Oh yeah, that's right. I've done this for a very long time, which means Every single time I open my phone, drafts is already open. So just unlocking my phone immediately has drafts open at all times. Highly, highly recommend this. <laughs> Super fun. Anyway, I'll quit talking. Uh, so, yeah, there's there's lots in this capture section. <laughs> totally is. I do like the, uh, in this chapter four, and the whole idea of, resonance um that's that's interesting and that's a great descriptive word I've, I've been using that a lot more since i i read this you don't need to capture everything and again in the mac power users forum there are people arguing that well depends on the type of books that you read maybe you do need to capture everything like okay fine capture the whole book then <laughs> for what i for what i do <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm looking for ideas, not details of a process I'm going to have to be able to repeat over and over and over again. If that's what you want to do, that still applies here. Like that is a second brain example. He talks about code libraries as a second brain. Go ahead and, and build those or swipe files for marketers. But the, the point is that there's all this information all around us and information is food for your brain. And uh, this kind of gets into like the quality of the dots that you you collect, right? So this is an idea I picked up years ago, and I've been trying to collect better dots, have a better information diet, things that are more valuable, more nutritious, right? If you want to get into like the the diet analogy here, um, you can choose what you want to feed on, but you are what you consume is an another point that he makes in this this section. So collect the things that are important to you and have the idea of these things that you collect. These are going to become, he calls them knowledge assets. And I like the term asset because that implies something that is going to be valuable over time. It's not something that seems important right now. It's not something that will be important at some point. It is something that is both important now and in the future, but it is going to get better as I keep it in this second brain and as i develop it he's got a whole bunch of different examples of these these knowledge assets but the very the, the thing I, I, my very favorite thing from this chapter is this idea of thinking like a curator um, because i've i realized as i was going through this and, and understanding the uh, the code system i've actually developed my own sort of version of this <laughs> i call it the five c's of creativity and uh, it's capture, curate is the second one. So he's just kind of combined those two. But for me, uh, I capture everything that seems important in the moment. And then uh, I transfer about 10% of it over into Obsidian and 10% even maybe high. The things that are really important will come over, but most of it I, I throw away. And a curator, like a curator in a museum, kind of like you're deciding what to add to the collection. But the collection becomes more valuable, not just based on the things that you add, but also on the things that you choose not to add because it doesn't fit. You know, one of these things is not like the other. Well, don't put it in your second brain then. It may be important for somebody else doing something totally different, but for what you're doing right now, it doesn't belong in your collection. And uh, I feel like that's a, a really important step that 
coming back to like the, the problem with, with Evernote, just dump everything in there. There's no filter. This might be, might be important. And it's just text. These are just markdown files. I may as well just throw it in there and then I can find it if I think about it later, but you lose some of the spontaneity and the, 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 the spontaneous re reactions that can occur as your ideas bump into each other if you have a whole bunch of of garbage in there or things and garbage isn't the right word but things that don't belong things that really don't have any sort of value to you there's another piece of this section curious your thoughts on it mike the 12 favorite problems piece <laughs> And uh, this this comes from Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman. And Feynman? Feynman. 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 There you go. Uh, I know this because uh, David Sparks and I recorded a, a focused episode on this specific thing. Got the it. 12 favorite problems. Got it. <laughs> uh, basically, the concept here is that Feynman had 12 problems that he would regularly try to come up with new ideas for or keeping top of mind i guess would be the way to say it and these questions were would be things that would be something that he wants to try to solve doesn't mean he's gonna like make that his life goal it's just things he wants to keep around something to uh have his list pet projects i guess and I've never really thought about this, but having having certain problems, and, and he has a list of examples here, like how do I live less in the past and more in the present? Like if that's a problem that you're trying to keep on your mind and you're trying to solve, your tendency is going to be to see things through that lens. So if, if, if let's say you're talking about PKMs and Obsidian, but I'm thinking about how can I live less in the past and more in the present. My tendency is going to be wanting to see how Obsidian or a PKM can help me process things now instead of processing things from the past. Like you, you get what I'm saying? Like the lens changes. But yep. if I have things in my past that I've never dealt with, and my problem is how do I overcome things that I've dealt with in the past? I'm going to see the exact same topic through the lens of how can I process what happened to me in the past? You know what I'm saying? Like, so it can completely change the way that you view that topic because of that, because you have these problems on top of mind, like it just can help form your, your thinking at the time. Have you ever tried to do something like this, like, ex like writing down favorite problems to process? Is this, I've never even tried this. I've been debating making this right an action here. item. You want to hear them? Sure, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been debating coming up with 12. I've not ever done this, but it seems like it would be a cool idea. It is. It's a fascinating idea. I haven't actually implemented these. Well, I guess like I've written them down, and the goal is to look at these weekly and just kind of bring attention to them, and then I'm believing that they are going to subconsciously kind of change how I approach some of the, the things that I come in contact with. Uh, that's the whole idea behind the, the 12 problems. I did some research into this after reading about it in the book because I thought it was an interesting idea. And then, um, yeah, David and I wrote them down together. So uh, how can I make things easier or simpler is my first one. How can I live with more meaning? How can I create more and consume less? Who are my true fans and what do they want? How can I better lead and serve my family, wife, and kids? How can I better understand the other side? That one in particular, like just to give you an example of how these can be beneficial, how can I better understand the other side? There's a lot of ways that that could manifest, but one obvious example could be with somebody who doesn't believe the same way you do politically or religiously, whatever. They have a different, different set of beliefs. The tendency is just to, oh, well, you... Don't you're not as enlightened as I am, right? <laughs> right? You haven't discovered the truth yet, so I'm not going to listen to anything that you have to say. And I want to instead listen to understand. Like I want to understand where the other side is is coming from, even if it doesn't completely change my mind about something. I want to at least understand their arguments uh, instead of just assuming that they're wrong until they get my attention and, and prove otherwise. 
So I feel like just approaching conversations that way obviously can have a, a world of a world of good in the in the atmosphere and the culture that we live in right now. Um, how can I have more fun? What would what about this would make a good story? What can I learn here? How can I set my kids up for success? How can I leave my dent in the universe? How can I focus on what really matters? They, these are not specific problems to be solved. There's no project associated with these. There's no completion date on a lot of these. I guess you could say the ones with my kids, those will be completed when they're adults. But otherwise, that's kind of the whole point of the favorite problems is that this will mean something when you read it once and, oh, I know exactly how to apply this. And then that thing is done. And then you find a new way to apply it in the future. Yes. And now I feel like I want to do this. I'm writing it down. I'll take right. this on. Action item. <laughs> yep. I'll take it on. It's. It just sounds like it would be super helpful just to have these. I, I guess, how often do you review these? That would be a question for you. Full is weekly. Weekly? That makes sense. But I've only had them for a week. So, so you don't know. But, once <laughs> once <laughs> nice work uh that would be the question is like I, I i know that the goal with this is to have them fresh enough in your mind that you they are a lens of sorts that you see things through and if you're not reviewing them probably weekly at least every other week i would think they would get to the point where you, you they're not on the front of your mind so then it doesn't work like the 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 problem doesn't follow through, I guess. Could be. Uh, I think this is a lot like the core values or anything that you want to ingrain in your day to day living. Like the the core values, uh, I have them framed and printed on the living room wall, so I see them all the time. Uh, I'm not going to frame my twelve favorite problems, but if I really wanted to make them top of mind all the time, I could make them my desktop wallpaper sure. or I could put them on my lock screen on my phone or something like that. Uh, I think for me personally, reviewing them once a week is going to be enough once I get in the habit of it to kind of ingrain these and give me the value from creating them. But your mileage may vary. Okay. I'm, I'm going to rabbit trail here for a second. When people put images of their questions or things that they want to be reminded of regularly on their wallpaper. Why? Because it's always covered. If you're a rational working person on your computer, it's always covered. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. That's weird. Like I could have something on my wallpaper, but I would never see it. Like there's no sure. point in me doing that. Anyway, I don't know why. I don't understand that. Do you see yours? I feel like this is maybe I'm just strange. I I never mine like, is mine yes. is a, a cool moods wallpaper by Matt Birchler, so I don't need to see it all the time. Sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I don't know this diversion. That's what that was. Okay, let's unless there's something you want to see on capture. I feel like we should go to organize because this one's gonna cause us some consternation potentially um all right let's do it so let's go on to organize save for actionability and in this there are it's a lot of things I'm, I'm like where do i even want to start here so let's just jump into the one that everybody knows about para p-a-r-a -A, if you don't know that stands for projects, areas, resources, and archives. This is his recommendation for how you store notes. Like, again, we're, we're like working our way into the tactical side of this. And his recommendation is you have a folder. This could be in mail, your, your email. It could be in, in our case, like Obsidian, in your documents folder, everywhere. You have a folder for projects, you have a folder for areas, you have a folder for resources, and you have a folder for archives. And if I can explain this correctly, anytime you have a project, it's a time-bound work that you're doing, you're creating that project folder in all of those, okay? You also have areas. These are things that are not time-bound, health, finances, faith, husband, father, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, your work life. Like, those are your areas with goals, like in games that you're working towards. 
Again, you have those in all of your places. You have resources. These are topics of interest that you just want to collect information on. Maybe you'll use it in the future. Maybe you won't. But it's of interest to you. Hobbies, you know, all that sort of thing. Manuals, maybe. Those are the things that you're collecting. They end up in resources. And then archives is the collection of things from the other three categories that you're no longer actively working on, right? And the the part of this, there's a term for this, and I forgot it. But the, the point of this is that when you work from projects to areas to resources to archives, it's a progression of actionability. So the entire structure is built on action and driven towards movement forward. So projects are your most uh, action worthy, I guess. Uh, areas are your second, resources your third, archives are cold storage, right? So they're not actioned at all. That's the concept there. And I know that you likely have strong opinions on this. I've actually gone through the process of experimenting with this in the past and have kind of some mixed reviews on it. Having read this, I, I kind of have a better understanding of what was intended with it. Um, what are your thoughts, Mike? Do you do this? I'm guessing the answer is no. And I'm not entirely certain why I think that. No, I do not do this. <laughs> okay. I think the, the goal of this system I agree with because uh, he mentions that PARA is not a filing system, it's a production system. What people really care about is the ability to create something new. And that manifests differently for me than it does for an engineer. <laughs> but I think that if you were going to start by project, the things that have a start and end date and have a clear outcome, that provides the clarity that you need to actually do something with the rest of the information that you collect. So I agree with it in principle. I just don't feel like I need this. I feel my system at the moment is very much working for me in terms of helping me to create. <laughs> so I have been looking for ways to, rather than implement PARA, implement some of the ideas and, and refine what I currently have going. Like I said, I've basically got my five C's of creativity that I do instead, which is to capture, to curate. Uh, I think I didn't go through the rest of them, but cultivate. And that's basically the, it, it's in my system and I'm going to continue to grow it and connect it was the fourth one. So once I understand what the idea is in isolation, then I compare it w with some of the other things in my collection, uh, very a la how to read a book, syntopical reading. Um, and then the last part is the create, express what this means to me. Now I don't have a book to sell you, but yeah, <laughs> not yet. That's the one that resonates with me more than than uh, code or even uh, para. But uh, I, I do think a lot of what I just described exists inside of code. I feel like para for the right person is how code gets implemented. Uh, I think it's also for me specifically the area where there is not as much overlap with the stuff that's important to me. Yeah, this is, so, so I guess the five C's of creativity do you use that to organize files and such? Because I feel like that's ultimately what he's getting at. It's like, how do you organize this stuff? Uh, I, I know, let's let, let's ignore mm -hmm. PKM world, right? Knowing that yep. that is something separate because I texted you about that in this week and I have thoughts on that one that I want to get into here in a second. But as far as like file storage systems, he's recommending this PARA method. Does your five C's translate into that? I guess maybe I'm asking <laughs> a weird question. No, because I don't want it to. <laughs> sure, yeah, and that's fair. So, I mean, uh, th this is why I, I, I kind of uh, judged the last section on, on tagging because I know that Tiago uses Evernote, and I know that with Evernote specifically, there are a couple of mechanisms you can use to group things together. Why do you want to group things together? Because I want to consider them in certain scenarios, certain situations. 
It's the same sort of thing with a task manager. If you're using a task manager the right way, what it does is you dump everything in there and then it surfaces at the right time the things that you should be paying attention to so you don't have to sort through everything else and, and figure out what is the thing that is really important that I should be paying attention to at, at this moment. So Para is basically a folder-based structure or a tag-based structure that you can use to group and clump things together. But you know what's better than both of those, in my opinion? Bidirectional linking. <laughs> but I can't do that with Photoshop files. Like, I can't sure. do that that's with... Fine. So that's that's why I was saying, if I leave the PKM piece out of this, right? Uh, like, that's, that's the part Photoshop that... Photoshop files are really ideas. They are something that you create as the expression of an idea, but as you're doing the rest of the process with the idea, that's not existing most likely as a Photoshop file. That's probably text in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, so let's, so here's an example. I'm in the middle of recording a bunch of video interviews for uh, a consolidated video that I'm working on for a Sunday morning service, right? Uh, I have eight different interviews I'm recording, which means I'm going to end up with three video files and one, two, three, four, five, six audio files for every interview, right? So all of that has to get consolidated somehow in one place. So like somehow I have to keep all the, keep track of all those. This is where the projects thing comes in handy because I can create the folder for the project and it all goes there. Now I would also have a text file that corresponds to that to help me understand some of my notes around that, but I still have to store those files somewhere. Like I can't throw that into Obsidian cleanly. That's just painful. I've looked at people trying to do that before, and it's like just don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> it's a bad idea. So I guess that's the part that doesn't add up there. Yeah, uh, I mean, I it it depends what you're trying to do. Uh, I have one version of that, but none of my stuff is Photoshop files that I do dump inside of Obsidian. Uh, an example would be notes.faithbasedproductivity.com, which I shared with you, like yep. my cross-reference library for my sermon sketch notes, which is a combination of images that I've drawn in GoodNotes plus the plain text files for each individual verse. And uh, if you go to that URL, it's public you can kind of navigate around my sermon sketch notes and see how like verse referenced here was also referenced in other, other places. Like that's the, the real value of, of that kind of stuff for me. How do I fit something like that into para? I could probably figure out a way to do it, but I just don't want to. Yeah. Now you could also in your para system inside of your notes app, you could probably link to a Photoshop file or something that you are working on or a video file or things like that. I tried to do video inside of Obsidian. I, for a while I was collecting my guitar lessons, which I uh, would always get these little videos on like what I'm supposed to work on and dump them in there, but it just got, it got too big. <laughs> yeah. So there are limitations with it. Uh, and I think that's okay. Um, you don't really want a single app that does everything. Tiago kind of talks about that in the first section, actually. Let's see if I can find that. He mentions that the perfect app doesn't exist, but what you want is a, uh, a, a, a reliable set of tools, right? So everyone's set of tools are going to be different based on the types of knowledge and information that you're trying to manage. And however you're going to create and express that, that's fine if you got to jump over to a, a, a different tool. But, and I, I think if you're talking about files that exist across a bunch of different tools, then having a, folder-based para structure on your computer makes a ton of sense. It just doesn't work for me. Yeah. I will say that, like, I'm, and this is an action item for me. I'm going to do a para experiment. I've done this before without fully understanding it, and it didn't go well. Now, that said, part of the reason I'm interested in doing this, and I've currently got this set up, so I know how that structure can go, but... For years now, I have operated under the, the the process of having a folder for projects that then get moved into an archive. Like I've done that for a long time. And then outside of that, I've had folders for like areas of my life and, and like work areas alongside 
like hobby type folders. Like I've done that for a very long time. Reading this made me realize that I've kind of done para for a long time, just in a different layout. And the one part of it that doesn't add up, and I texted you about this. It's like the, the thing that does work really well is like if I'm in finder or, well, I don't even do this in my email stuff. Email just goes all in one folder. I'm terrible. Uh, maybe it's not terrible. Maybe it's genius. I don't know. It's one of the two. And I, I have kept things in, uh, folder structures that mimic something similar to this quite for quite a while. The part that doesn't add up is when you get to like PKM world and you're trying to categorize, I guess is the way to say it, different notes. Like when you get into just the tech note, text notes side of it, that part didn't add up. But I say that and yet I've got a script and I use this weekly, at least, if not more than, uh, for creating a note for a project in a projects folder in Obsidian that also creates the folder in Finder for me and then creates links between the two so that I can get to one or the other from either place. I've done that for a while now. So I just maintain that because I did go ahead, and, go ahead and try to set up Para in Obsidian. And I think I found something that works well, at least given the structure that I already had. Keeping my projects like I had before, I already got the folder. The areas actually acts kind of like the maps piece because I realized that I was kind of doing that already that. in Obsidian. So it kind of translates to that. So it's not folders of notes for areas. It's one folder that has notes of, I guess, maps would be what to call it. Uh, and then the resources piece has like your assets folder. Like everybody seems to have a folder for where if you drag and drop a picture in there, it's got to go somewhere, right? The picture file mm -hmm. has to go somewhere. Templates, dated, like daily notes and stuff like those types of folders are under there. That's really it. I don't keep folders under the rest of the resources piece at all. That's like kind of like having the notes piece that's like everything thrown in one spot. That's what ends up going in the resources. And then the archive is the same as it always has been for me. It's like, that's where the done projects and done areas go. But outside of that, I've got what I call a zero note. A lot of people have these like the starting note uh, where you can jump off of from uh, into a bunch of different areas. All I really did, cause I, I had my setup, which is, I think was somewhat similar to yours, Mike, where most everything was kind of in one spot and you had notes with links that got you a, diff a lot of different places. It's still kind of the same for me. It's just laid out differently. The way you jump yes. from thing to thing is all the same. I don't know that this is going to work long term, but it's at least a starting off point. I just want to kind of see how it plays out because so far it hasn't changed much at all for me. So I don't know. We'll see. That's the thing about to be honest, is I don't think it's a simple just apply this structure everywhere. Right. Uh, and I think in the past, maybe it was. But the real value of applying the principles that Tiago is talking about as it pertains to Para, this can look very different nowadays. And it should look very different as you figure out what is the right way to apply this for yourself? I came across a quote in uh, The Road Less Stupid by Keith Cunningham. He talks about beware of people selling Kool-Aid. And he uses examples of like Warren Buffett. It took him nine years to make his first $10 million on the stock market. He's like, no one's going to buy a book, How to Make $10 Million in Nine Years. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right, but that's what success looks like. Uh, is it's it's slow and it's methodical. And so the people who are like, hey, I did this and it blew up and just do this thing. Those are the people you got to be wary of. And there's a quote in there that said, consultants have a recipe, but masters have a cookbook. And I was thinking about that as it pertains to the productivity space and the types of things that we read, the different systems that we, we hear about. And I feel like Tiago is not selling a recipe he is providing you a cookbook a whole bunch of principles that if you really wrestle with and grapple and understand uh, the arguments then you will find 
how to express these for yourself in a way. But for me, if you're asking me, do I use Para? I've taken the principles and morph them so much from the original that I can't in good faith say, yes, I do this. <laughs> right, right. Similar to GTD, but right? does this in some way, shape, or form if they're into the whole personal knowledge management idea. Yeah, it's it's totally true. I think like some of what, and, and you can see that based on what I just explained. Like These are things that I've kind of done already, just haven't organized them in that way. That said... The, the concept of organizing it from most actionable to least actionable, like if, one of the things that I personally struggle with is knowing what to work on next. Like that's that's forever mm -hmm. the thing that I, I find myself fighting is like, okay, I have these six things or 400 things and I want to know which of those, you know, 200 that I, I need to like put above the other 200, you know? And then within that, I got to figure out where in the hierarchy do things land it's very easy for me to take something that's a hobby and put it over something i have to get done today i have no idea why i have to fight this battle every single day but here we are and so so knowing that i already struggle with the actionability and knowing what comes next organizing things in a way that automatically puts it in order for me is extremely helpful so although Mission accomplished Right, you've got a little bit of structure, which makes Correct. what you got to do easier. You don't have to try to bend it and oh, I got to follow it exactly. Yep, get the value and move on. Right. Correct. <laughs> yep. So like that's that's that concept is one that I didn't have in the back of my head when I first started this para experiment, but had slowly been working my way towards something similar to that. Uh, so I think maybe that's why I'm I'm interested in this. I don't think I'm going to end up keeping the terminology over time, uh, but the concept of actionability, like that one I get. So that's partly why I want to do this experiment because I know that that's something I struggle with and it feels like this is, at least in my short-term stint of using it, it seems to help. But as anyone who listens to Bookworm knows, long-term for Joe is always the trick, right? That's That's forever the thing that I have a challenge with so like that i want to know how does it handle six months from now am i still using that type of structure we'll see the goal of the structure in this chapter is to place things where they will be useful the soonest so if para helps you recognize where things will be useful the soonest go ahead and use it for me that's not where they're going right. to be useful right. the soonest. I know exactly what that looks like for me, though. Yep. And so if you have no idea where to start, I have no problem starting with Para. I have morphed my my uh, system into something that no longer resembles it, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, let's, let's go on to the next section. I think this is one that we're both kind of excited about. I know especially you are uh, putting words in your mouth again. Uh, distill find the essence and there's there's one core piece inside of this that i think is absolutely the most important i think we maybe mentioned the term earlier uh, and that is the progressive summarization technique and just just as a as, by way of example what this is and i'll maybe get into the importance of it but let's say that you have uh, an article that you find online that is super helpful. Like you, you found an article on tuning the carburetor for a chainsaw. I bring that up because it's something I had to do here recently. And that's got a lot of information in it. There's a whole bunch of stuff in it that might be helpful, might not. But regardless, you're pulling the Evernote uh, mindset and you saved the whole thing, right? Tiago would probably not be thrilled with you that you saved the whole thing. So you go through and you grab the parts that are most important that you're going to hold on to in that. You get rid of the ones you don't. Once you've done that, then you have this process of, what is it, four steps? Yeah, you've got the capturing piece that you start with. Mm -hmm. Then you go through, I'm going to use the way that he recommends it. You bold the sections or the components within that that are the most important. Then within those bold pieces, you highlight the pieces that are even more important, that are like the, the core, 
of those bolded sections. And then beyond that, the fourth step is writing in an executive summary that summarizes the entire piece, right? So then you've taken what started off as a pretty long, maybe a two or three paragraph excerpt, and you've got it distilled down into maybe a one or two sentence summary. That's, that's what he's referring to as a progressive summarization technique. Now, that said, this is not something you do immediately. You can, but he, he's not saying that you have to. It's an as needed basis. Like you come back onto this note six months from now and you've got a meeting where you're gonna be talking about some of the things in it. Well, that's a good time to you know, go through and bold all the, the important parts and maybe highlight on top of that. Uh, and then you've got a talk you're gonna give, write your summary for it. Like you don't have to do these all at once, but it's that process of moving it from one step to the next so that you can get down to the essence, as he calls it, of that section. How'd I do? Did I tell it well? You did. Do you do this? Not yet. You gonna do it? Maybe. In theory, it's a great idea. It seems like an awful lot of work, but I think that's the <laughs> point, right? So as you were describing that, I got the revelation that I do this already. <laughs> yeah. Do you do it in the same form or do you have different ways of doing it? Nope. I don't do it in the same form. I figured. So I published a uh, something on my blog years ago on how and why I take notes on the books that I read. Yep. But let's just walk through these four different levels though, right? So you've got the original work, right? That's the books that we read. And then you want to distill that down into just the important pieces, right? So that's what I do with the mind node files. And then from there, so that's kind of like bolding things, I guess. And then you've got the, uh, the highlighted passages. So all the stuff that's bolded, everything that's in the mind node file, I have an emoji system for calling out specific things. And each emoji means a different thing. So it's not as simple as a highlight. It's, and essentially I've got several different emoji based highlighters. And then when I bring it all into Obsidian, I force myself at the top of the book note to write a three sentence summary of the book itself. <laughs> so I follow this point by point, <laughs> but only for super long form things that I read that are hundreds of pages long. Could I do this for a lot of the other things that I, the articles that I read and things like that? Yeah, I could, I'm not going to. And I think that's okay because I feel like with all of this stuff, you got to figure out, I said this over and over again today, but you got to figure out what parts of this system work for you and how to make it your own. And I think if Tiago were here, he would say the, the same thing. So for me, I'm going to implement this with my book notes. I'm not going to worry about it for anything else. And somebody else is going to be like, oh, I can't believe you're not doing it with this other thing. And they're going to just implement it in, in that arena. And that's going to be fine, fine as well. But the idea itself, obviously I agree with it. And obviously I think it has value because I've been doing it even though I didn't realize it for the last several years. <laughs> yeah. Which is, which is similar to my experience with the para thing, right? Like realizing, oh yeah, I'm doing a lot of this already. Just hadn't termed it quite like that. And it's slightly different. Yeah. I get you. So yes, I know that like, this is something that I don't do currently. Uh, one of the reasons for that is I've never, I shouldn't say never, I have not found myself capturing longer like paragraphs of articles or segments of a YouTube video or podcast clips. Like I've not done that. I'll, I'll grab the URL sometimes and then be done there, which he talks about at one point during the capture piece is like, no, don't do that. Grab the part that matters. And yep. like that, that was something that was super uh, impactful for me because I don't do that, which then means like I'm regularly going back and redoing searches without realizing that that's what I'm doing. I could not have told you that I do that until I read this. I didn't know that that was something that I did. So to, to get to the point where I'm starting to process my, like grabbing those components and then doing that distillation 
Like that, I, I understand. Now, to use the books piece, because this is the one arena that's a little weird. Uh, I shouldn't say weird. That's maybe got me in some of that. Uh, not all of those steps, though. So obviously, we have the book itself, right? I do the process of underlining and creating an index in the back of the book. I realize I don't talk about this a whole lot. So I will underline or like put brackets around things on the outside margins. Every once in a while, I'll write a note in the margins. But then at the back, I regularly create, and this one's actually kind of long, uh, an index of terms or action items and stuff in the back of the book with the page number next to it. So like that's kind of like the bolding component. And then from there, what happens is I'll grab, like, especially in this case, like this is my choice of a book, right? I will grab the parts within that index that I want to talk about on Bookworm. That's kind of like the highlighting piece, right? They go into the show notes for us to follow for the book. Now, that kind of gets morphed into the outline for the book, the, the table of contents. Like it kind of goes hand in hand once it hits the show notes, uh, but not entirely. But from there, it kind of stops at us recording the podcast. And then I'm, I'm done. I move on to the next thing uh, and frequently fail to do the action items that I collected from those things. <laughs> so that is a thing that happens as which, well. Which uh, Tiago might argue is the result of it not getting into a digital commonplace Correct. book. Correct. <laughs> yes. He would probably <laughs> make that argument. Why... He's not necessarily yeah, well... wrong either. In that <laughs> no i was gonna say one of the things that i have amended uh when i started bringing things into obsidian was in addition to the mind map that i dump into the file i also because i do it all in mind note i can export that as markdown i copy and paste the text of the mind map in the note file as well and that gives me the ability to link the text through the bi-directional linking and things like that yep. which we're going to get into in the the next chapter hopefully yeah <laughs> yeah but uh i i think that that's that's valuable and I, I i think even like the building a second brain concept you probably don't have to go all in with just digital tools what you're doing i think fits the definition of a second brain and the the description of the organization that you're talking about here in terms of distilling things down into your key ideas in the back of a book that is an analog version of this progressive summarization i would argue I'm not sure if tiago would agree with that part uh, he may say you need to make it digital in order to get the benefit of connecting the things different ways, but yeah, well, let's, let's, let's go on to this last piece, this, so the E here, capture, organize, distill, express. Okay. Now the tagline here is show your work. And in this there, there's essentially a, a few things that you're going to be doing. So once you have notes that are distilled you've create like major notes for your own thoughts you've distilled the ones that you've captured you end up with what he calls intermediate packets packets yes intermediate packets yep. basically small little snippets uh, that can then be consolidated in a lot of different ways or retrieved in a lot of different ways and he talks about the power of thinking small and it has a whole bunch of examples like betas and software prototypes and car design like people do this regularly you start with a minimum viable and then you build up from there uh, and he's referring to this as like an intermediate packet a small thing that is then put together kind of like lego blocks now <laughs> just call them brain legos or something like yeah that. totally I actually, I actually have uh so Spoiler alert, I guess, for my Mac stock talk, I'm going to be talking about those five C's of creativity. Yep. And uh, PKM workflows associated with those. And all of my slides are using images that I drew in GoodNotes. Uh, and I have one which it talks about ideas as Lego building blocks. I was hoping we get to this point. These intermediate packets, these are individual building blocks that make up your work. But the whole that term of intermediate packets, that probably, maybe that resonates different for you because developer right yeah <laughs> but uh you, lo you lost me there i feel like there's a much more approachable uh term that could be used there but the idea itself i really agree with sure yeah it didn't even i didn't even bat an eye when he said intermediate packets like oh yeah it's the stuff between the beginning and the end okay like immediately like my brain just <laughs> jumped to that instantly so Atomic no notes i would call them 
Yeah. Okay. What was it? Atomic notes. Atomic notes. Okay. So, uh, the whole idea of like the definition of atomic from Atomic Habits, where it's the smallest part of a thing. Yeah. And then I argue that those are the types of notes that you should create, because then you can take those notes and you can build them, and combine your your ideas in in cool and interesting ways. It's the whole basis of the cross reference thing that I shared earlier. If you don't break it down into those tiny little individual notes, it doesn't work. Yep. Yeah. And then once you have those atomic notes, intermediate packets, IPs, I'm going to call them IPs. It makes sense to me. <laughs> uh, once you have these little tiny bits that you've distilled, you can start putting them together. But the important part is how do you retrieve those? Like what are what are the methods by which you can retrieve those? Which is kind of what I think you're itching to get to here. But the four, he has four methods here. One is through search, which is probably people's first, you know, easy one. Then browsing, just yep. finding your way through. Um, I want to come back to that one. Three is tags, and he's got a bonus chapter we'll maybe talk about later with that. And then four serendipity just randomly shows up, like just out of nowhere. That's kind of the way I took that. Now, before you jump in, I want to come back to the browsing piece because he did not intend it this way, but he's talking about how like when you're just working through your folders, you'll run across things. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I only got to the point where I understood that that's what he meant and after I read his section on it. When he first mentioned it, what I thought he was going to get into, my expectation of where we were going to go, was that you can use folders, you could use tags, you could use links, you could use all sorts of methods to find your way around from note to note. That's what I thought he was going to say, but he didn't. He focused on the folders piece. Okay, so I just want to point that out because I feel like that my original intention would get us to where I think you're wanting to go. Um, but yes. I think that's not what he originally would have said, at, at least when he wrote this. Yeah. So knowing that building a second brain has been around for a while, uh, this feels like a historical model that just hasn't been updated yet. Sure. And I have no disagreements with any of the things on this list, but you're right bi-directional linking is missing <laughs> yes and it's an obvious one um, given our current landscape right correct it's also understandable why it's not in the list when you understand that the author is using evernote because it's missing from evernote and so I, i'm going to read between the lines here and say that tiago would wholeheartedly endorse that as a, another retrieval method but he is not going to speak to it because he has no experience with it and that's just understanding the the basic ideas that he's trying to communicate through this code framework, which I completely agree with up until this point. <laughs> what about the bi-directional links? So yeah, obviously for me, that's a big part of how I express things. Uh, I would argue that for me, bi-directional links is more than just a retrieval mechanism though. It's also part of the organization which I guess actually the first three of these tags, browsing, uh, maybe not search, although, yeah, I, I don't know. But these, these all are all based off of like where you put something and how you classified something. So there's organizational aspects of, of these as well. I feel like organization and expression are, are tied together uh, with how you would, how, how you organize determines how you express things. Uh, and really the the real point of emphasis and the, the place where the value is to be had here is to put some thought into how you're going to organize things so that you can create more of those serendipitous moments where you happen to be in a folder or you happen to be looking at a note and you see something that's linked to it. And, oh, I get it now. That's what we're really going after. However you want to do that is fine. Yeah, because I think that, you know, the search piece... Like you're saying, the organization piece and the express piece can be tied. Uh, I, th I think what he's getting at, like if I try to capture the uh, basis of what he's saying in express, is that the way that you've done everything up to this point allows you to start putting things together. Like 
the expression piece, like I can yep. connect all these dots. Like that's what he's trying to get to is how you do that here. And the search component here, like, yes, that's his first one, but at the same time, like I, I find that messy because there, there's such a thing as like a saved search or a query in there. And, and then the question is, well, okay, well, where does that actually fit? And when you have something like a mm -hmm. saved search combined with something like links between things, and those two can coexist in one set, like, like in one note, like this all gets super messy, super fast. Right. So yep. I, I, Agreed. I like that tools are now allowing us to do that sort of thing. Like this can be super fluid and help us surface things. So I just think that like you're saying, like Evernote's world doesn't really step into any of that. And I know we're ripping on Evernote a little bit, but I think that's okay. I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> so just knowing that it does mean that it's a little dated. Um, yeah. What else? We got part three here. We're getting long. That's it. Okay. Let's go to part three. Part three, the art of creative. Nope. That is not what I wanted to say. The art of creative uh, execution is the chapter title. The part three is called the shift, making things happen. Uh, inside of this, he, he starts to like make the shift from how do you manage things to what's the results of managing it? Like it, it starts to kind of mm -hmm. get back into the promise of a second brain, like what can become from this. And inside this first chapter, there's the concept of divergence and convergence where you have an idea and then you want to collect a whole bunch. Like you're starting to widen the gates on what you're collecting around an idea, which as he spells out, is kind of like the capture and organize piece. Like you're broadening, trying to capture and, and collect a bunch of things. And then you reach mm -hmm. a point where then you start to diverge and you come back together. And at that point, you're starting to distill things. You're starting to cull things. And then you get to the expression point where you have your final product. So you do widen out and then come back together. I've never yep. really visualized it that way, but it did kind of help me to understand it. It doesn't, it's not really anything groundbreaking, but kind of cool. Um, I think it's potentially groundbreaking, to be honest, because I feel he says convergence is where many people struggle because you find something new and shiny, sure, something that might be important, and then you see a whole bunch of ancillary things that are related to it. And so people have no problem widening, but they have a lot of trouble eliminating options and focusing on one thing. You got to decide for yourself what is really important. So the convergence part is the most important. I feel if you do the convergence, it's easy to express things at the end. And I feel like this visual, this very clearly communicates why you may have trouble expressing something at the end or creating something if you're going back to my five C's of, of creativity. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Same idea. If you have trouble creating a tangible asset at the end, whether that's a published post, a video, or just a simple note on like, this is what I think, a couple of sentences even, then you probably are scared to start converging on this idea. And you got to ask yourself why. I just feel like that's, maybe this is me some being someone who's dealt with a huge volume of ideas for a long time. Like that doesn't seem like it's that big a deal. Like, yeah, of course you have tons of ideas and at some point you have to narrow them down. Like that's something I've had to deal with for a long time and I'm terrible at it, but it is still something that I need to do. So I, I just don't think of that as something that's groundbreaking, but maybe I'm wrong on that. I'd be glad to be wrong on that. <laughs> so anyway, he, he has that, that concept, divergence that leads you up and then convergence that brings you back down as far as volume of things going into uh, a final work. But then he has this, these three strategies that he uses to bring creative work together is the way that he puts it. So essentially what he's got is three different methods that he uses to keep momentum moving forward or to, to connect things. Uh, the first of which is what he calls the, uh, I can never say this word, archipelago of ideas. Archipelago. Archipelago. I can never get that right. I always say it the wrong way. Give yourself stepping stones, right? So it's, it's a way of giving yourself, how do I say this? Giving yourself a whole bunch of things in front of you that you can then build on. 
I think we talked about this not too long ago where like if you want to come up with ideas for your next blog post, uh, go read a bunch of articles. Like have a bunch of things already in front of you that you can work from and build off of. So that's that's the first one. The second one is the Hemingway Bridge using yesterday's momentum today. Hemingway was known for uh, whenever he would wrap up his writing for the day, he wouldn't stop until he knew the next point in the plot where he knew where he was going to go next. Then he would quit. That way, when he got there tomorrow, he would know where to start writing right away and it could get the, the, the mindsets going where he wanted them to go. And then the last one is to dial down the scope, ship something small and concrete. Uh, this is something that I know a lot of people are starting to uh, recommend and do regularly, like share small snippets quickly and regularly, as opposed to waiting for something longer and bigger to be released. Um, I know you have a secret project you're doing that's similar to this. And I know that there's a lot of people who do stuff like that, where they've got these smaller bits that they're going to release regularly. Uh, I don't know what that means for me. I feel like it's something I should do, but it's still fascinating to me. Anyway, these are all ways that he has for trying to pull things together and get things shipped to say that, I guess, to get things out the door. Yeah, I didn't really jot down a whole lot of notes on these different strategies. Uh, I guess I see where they could be useful, but I feel like if you just follow the part two and you figure out how to make it work for your, yourself, then you kind of don't have to worry about these. <laughs> Yeah, I know that like this is some of these are just standard practice for a lot of people. Like these are these are kind of like your tips and tricks for how to keep going. Really? Yeah, exactly. That that's essentially exactly. what they are. Uh that yeah. said, let's let's go to the next one because I I'm quite certain at least I have opinions on this one. Uh the essential habits of digital organizers. Okay. Uh there's three, I believe. This is Tiago's system. Yes, this is Tiago. Tiago's deal. Implements it. So the three pieces, project checklists, one for the beginning and end of a project, uh, weekly and monthly reviews. I know we're both super excited about that. And then noticing habits, like the habit of noticing things. Uh, which of these are your favorites that you're going to implement, Mike? Uh, I'm not going to do any of these as he's outlined them. Okay. But, surprise, uh, surprise. Yeah, I don't need project checklists. My projects are typically podcast episodes or videos or things. And uh, I know what the flywheel looks like for yep. making that stuff. <laughs> so uh, the whole idea of the structure is to eliminate the, the friction. But at some point, there's diminishing returns and more structure actually adds more friction. So not going to do those. Uh, I do have a form of a weekly review, and I guess you could say I don't have a formal monthly review, but I do have a formal quarterly review in the personal retreats. So again, I'm doing the concepts, but I'm not doing them this way. Uh, although if you were to just start, if you're coming to this new and you're like, where should I begin? I would have no trouble saying, hey, start with the, the things that Tiago has recommended here. What about the noticing habits? Like trying to notice. Oh, you mean things. journaling? <laughs> sure. If that's that's how it comes out, sure. Yeah, I don't know. I, I when I hear opportunistic habits or noticing habits, I immediately think of just reflection. Yep. And uh, <laughs> I've mentioned my three questions that I use everywhere. What should I start doing? Stop doing? Keep doing? Those are my opportunistic habits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Like, there's there's so much of this I don't want to do. Like, I'm not going to do project checklists. Like, my stuff is d regularly different, but it's so obvious what done is and what is success that it's just not worth. It's not worth going through checklists to start and end them. That doesn't make sense to me. Uh, reviews. Yeah, if you have read, if you've read a lot of the books that we've read, uh, at this point in the book you can feel free to put it down. <laughs> yeah, it's really close. Yeah. And I think, you know, if, even if you go to, uh, in the next chapter, there's uh, the only piece of it that I found uh, maybe 
helpful for people uh, is starting on page 239. So the last chapter is called The Path of Self-Expression. Basically, it's a get started chapter. And he has these 12 steps. Is it 12? Yeah, 12 steps for uh, getting the whole system up and running. Like if you wanted to implement this to the letter, he's got a checklist for you on how to do that. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do this in, in any capacity, really. Mm -mm. There's there's components of the whole thing I'll implement, but not not like this. So yeah, if you wanted something to help you get going, that's 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 actually where he ends the formal book, is with those steps. So. Yep, I did not jot these down. I jotted down a couple of things which stood out to me from this chapter, like the fact that information is abundant and it's been scarce for most of human history and the value of labor has changed. What we do with our hands is more important than what we do or more what we do with our brains is uh, more important now for a lot of people than what we do with our, our hands. Some powerful ideas there, but I'm not going through any checklists. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to either. Uh, that leaves us with a bonus chapter about tagging. And if you if you read this chapter, like Mike did, um, I actually think I did actually uh, read this chapter, but I did not write anything down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so you don't know if you read it or not. I, I initially, my first thought was, well, this wasn't in the first run version that I had, but I, I did look and. It, uh, it was okay. So I I did look at this. I, I read through it, but I did not write anything yeah. down. Yeah, basically, he doesn't like tagging. Is my takeaway that might not be a hundred percent true, but he 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 recommends tags to indicate status of a note. Is probably the clean way nope. to say that. So not gonna do it. Work in progress. Done with the editor. Like those are the types of tags that he would recommend. Uh, seems very odd to me to to limit it to something like that. I say that knowing I'm not a big tagger. Like I'm not somebody that's big on tagging. My camera overheated. Super fun. <laughs> so yes, I'm not one that does tons of tagging, but I know that it's something that a lot of people absolutely adore. So. Not gonna diss on anybody who does that, but I'm not gonna pick it up anytime soon. Well, you probably do a version of this though, I would guess, uh, because I know you're into data view. And if you're into data view, you probably use YAML metadata. And YAML metadata is a form of tagging, I would argue. It's a better form of tagging. <laughs> and I do use some of the things that he describes in the YAML metadata section. Like I have a status for all the articles that I write and if it's in progress, it stays in the, the folder. But the minute I'm done with it, I change it status to published. And Hazel takes that file and moves it to an archive folder for me. Sure. <laughs> so am I doing para? I don't know. I've got the archive folder. I've got the, <laughs> nice. the tags, quote unquote, being updated. And yep. then an automation that's triggered based on that. But I don't, I don't view it that way. Right. You know, because right. I've made it my own, I guess. But. Yeah, and even like the data view stuff, I don't really think of that as tagging though because it's giving it a value within the value. Like it, it's it's a table cell scenario. It's not a binary scenario. So it's not a yes or no Boolean at all times. It's I've got a, a, a data field for link and I'm putting in the link for the article when it's done. Well, I can use that in a lot of different ways, but it's not... Like, a, it's not a yes, no, per se. It can sure. be, but it's not in most cases, at least for me. For some people, I'm sure it is. But that's the thing is, like, if you're going to try to teach me a tagging system, I, I, you've already lost me. Yeah. <laughs> because the beauty of tags is that they are so flexible, and whatever you decide to do with yours is not the way that other people should correct their tagging systems. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I struggle with tags and have for a long time because I've had my spells with using them for everything and it ends up in a scenario where it's just too hard to get it converted into a new system later. Like whenever I want to change the way I'm using them. So like that's always the part that makes it challenge. So anyway, long story short, 
I'm not using Tiago's system for tagging. Not at all. All right. Ready for action items? Let's do it. Unless there's something else you want to cover. But I have <laughs> nope. two carryovers from last time, writing my eulogy and my daily plan type thingy. And then I have three new ones for this time. One, I want to write out my 12 favorite problems, which sounds like it could be interesting. I'm going to do this para experiment, which I'm in the middle of now. So I'm just going to keep what I have and we'll see how that pans out. And then the, the last one that I wrote down here was I need to, I have a lot of ways of capturing things in their entirety. I don't have a lot of ways of capture, capturing segments of things. You follow me? So grabbing like a paragraph from an article and then getting that into drafts with the link to the article. Like I don't have clean ways of doing it. And I know that this is something, it's just a matter of like building Siri shortcuts and tying into drafts and such. Like there are easy ways to do this. I just don't have them right now. Um, so I need to build some of that stuff out. And I've got four or five things written down here that I want to do for that. Those actually might be shareable now that I say that when they're done. I'll look into that. That'll be fun. Was that kind of like a progressive summarization sort of a thing? Or, or what specifically are you... On the doing? capture side? Like the beginnings of progressive summarization. I'm having trouble defining this action item for you. Uh, the way I wrote <laughs> it was to uh, develop ways to capture segments of content. That's the way I wrote it down. If that helps you. All right. So that's what I got. How about you, sir? Cool. Uh, believe it or not, I have no action items from this book. What? <laughs> this book is like chock full of things that could be action items. I'm very shocked. Well, I by did that. the 12 favorite problems already before. And so, yeah, I'll justify my lack of action items in the, the style and rating section. But, I'm very surprised um, by that. <laughs> a lot of this stuff that's in here. I have implemented already okay. in the way that I want to. And there was nothing in here that I was like, aha, I need to change how I do something. This reinforced a lot of things and it brought new excitement and motivation to some of the stuff that I was bouncing around in my brain is like, this is what I think works for me. I have more confidence that yes, this does. This is the way that these things work for me at the, the moment. But there was nothing in here that I was like, I want to do this. Wow. I don't know. Sorry to, to shock you. I am, I'm a bit speechless on that one. Okay. <laughs> I guess we'll just keep going. So style and rating. I'll go first here. Uh, I, I will say Tiago does a good job of telling stories in places. He does get a little long-winded sometimes, I found, whenever he would get to like the, the parts where he was trying to introduce a topic. Like There were times when I, I wanted him to tell a story in order to get the point across as opposed to just trying to tell us the point. So I, I did notice that. And there's also some discrepancies in like how he poses one view versus another, like the versus thing. Uh, because he has, especially towards the beginning, there's a section of, uh, it, it's basically a story of two brains. Somebody who does it with their one and only brain and somebody who does it with their second brain. And in the, in the one where it's someone without a second brain, he gives them a name, he gives them a background, he tells the whole story of how things work for them throughout their day. When he gets into the story about somebody with a second brain, they don't have a name, they don't have a background, it's just all philosophical. Like there's no actual story there. To me, that was a very stark contrast and he didn't do a good job of making those two sides seem like equal, I guess, in the way that he presented them. There were a handful of these things that, that happened throughout the book that I noticed these things coming about like that. camera i gotta get a fan for this thing <laughs> or we just got to keep it under two hours <laughs> i know right <laughs> totally 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 um i i think that some of that is purely choice in how he put the book together uh and i wish he hadn't hadn't made those choices so anyway that's to say i think he he could improve his writing ability, but he does do a good job. It's not like this is a hard book to read. I'm just being 
particular with it. Uh, as far as a rating goes uh, and, and takeaways from this goes, I, I feel like this is probably, and folks who have followed me for a while know that I have not been super receptive to the PKM world, nor the terms that come with it, right? Maps of content and such. Uh, Blake's always trying to help me find different ways to interpret MOCs. So there's a lot of stuff with it that I've I've been very resistant to. And some of that I think is purely because I haven't fully understood some of the benefits and knowing that my brain is super fast paced, uh, it, it gets difficult for me to figure out how to use something like this and get that to slow down to a point where it's tolerable. So I, I say that and I put that preface in there because I feel like this is the first time I've been able to kind of get my head around the details of something like a PKM or a, to use his term, a second brain, a way of externalizing thoughts. Like I haven't been able to get my head around it very well. This is probably the first time I've felt like, okay, yeah, I'm, I think I'm ready to give this a full run. Now I, I don't have an action item of do PKM or build a second brain. I don't have that because I've kind of been on some of that journey already, just trying to get my head around it. So that said, he's done a very good job of showing me the case for that. And that's something that I know you have tried to do a number of times, Mike. Um, at some point, I feel like you and I are close enough that I tend to not listen <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so there, there is that component as well. Um, so that said, like, I think as far as a rating goes, I'm going to put this at a 4.0, knowing that there's a lot of really good stuff here and I've been able to have some pretty big takeaways from it, I feel, but have some pretty big qualms with the way he's pitching, pitching some of this. And then also like, there's some, like, I don't need weekly reviews. Like I'm not doing it. Those are things that you do because you love GTD. I'm not doing that. Like, it's just not a thing I'm going to do. So, anyway, thanks for the MOC translations in the chat, guys. You guys are doing <laughs> doing God's work right there. So, you just justified my lack of action items. I'm not sure <laughs> if you recognize that. Okay. You mentioned uh, that you were on this PKM journey and implemented some of this stuff already. Uh, so, I've been on this journey for the last couple of years, and... I feel like every other uh, every other action item that could have been associated with the stuff that I would have read in this book, I have implemented in some way, shape, or form, as evidenced by the number of links of things that I have made <laughs> that have aligned with the right. topics that we've discussed. I was watching you today. drop links the in the chat. Time, <laughs> yeah, this is the first time I've got like four or five different links. It's like, hey, I already wrote this up over here. <laughs> That's never happened before. Now, that being said, uh, I feel like the personal knowledge management stuff and building a second brain stuff, there is a lot of overlap there. Uh, they are kind of the same thing in a lot of ways, but I, uh, I'm 100% behind this idea. I feel like the message in this book is much better than honestly I thought it was going to be because I had an idea of building a second brain previously of this is what it is. Uh, and actually that started to change once I went through the the course, but reading the book specifically, there was a whole bunch of stuff in my notes here that some of it we covered, some of it we didn't. There was a lot of things that you know, spoke to me, resonated to me. That's a word that comes up all the time in the focus episode. Tiago talks about that term because his dad was a musician. They would have other musicians over for dinner and they'd look at art and be like, oh, that really resonates with me. And I really like that idea. It's like something goes off inside of you. Resonance is like a reverberation. So it's like a reverberation in your soul. You can tell when you look at something, oh, I should keep this. And that's totally different than the anxious pressure of like, I better keep this just in case I need this later so I don't get burned. That's how I used Evernote for a really long time. That's how a lot of people will use a digital filing cabinet. And I feel like building a second brain with the emphasis on the creativity, this is an idea whose time has come. Uh, he talks about the very end, the last chapter, how when you implement this stuff, your brain will shift from consuming to creating. And that's where the real value is. Create, not consume. It's on my lock screen. 
because I want to whenever or my uh, my home screens because uh, when I open up my phone, I want a couple of apps when I first look at it. And a, is a big message, create, not consume as a reminder, just a gentle nudge like, hey, don't just go consume things. Don't dip into the infinity pools, but do something positive, do something intentional with this technology. With great power comes great responsibility. Building a second brain shines a spotlight on like how you can actually use this for your benefit. And I feel like that's really, really important. It's really, really powerful. And the book itself, I feel like, is a great entry point into this topic for people. I don't know of a whole lot of other like personal knowledge management or PKM type books. I know courses. I know YouTube channels like Nick Milo, Linking Your Thinking. I love the stuff that he does. But I don't know of another book I could recommend to somebody to, hey, you're interested in PKM. This is the place to start. I 100% recommend building a second brain. Uh, this book is is great. And for me, the value kind of ended getting into part three, but I can totally see how for somebody who is beginning out on their PKM journey, there's some revolutionary stuff in there that complements very well the things that he's talking about in part one and part two. Uh, part two itself, you know, I, I went into it thinking, oh boy, a system I'm not going to get a whole lot out of this because I'm not going to agree with the system. Well, guess what? I don't agree with the, the system as it's codified, but I agree with all of the principles that the system is based upon. Right. So once I wrestle with that myself and I realize that, you know what? You have a lot more in common here than you, uh, you have differences. I, I view building a second brain not as like a contrary system, a competing idea. This is very much the exact same thing that I'm doing with my five C's of creativity. We're allies. We're speaking the same language. We're preaching the same message here. And having met Tiago, I also feel that I, my impression of him is he is a very authentic person. Uh, this is not, he's not a, one of those snake oil salesmen. Uh, I am happy to see the success that is happening right now around this whole idea of building a second brain. And the, the book itself, I think, is at the top of the New York Times bestsellers list or something. He tweeted something about that recently. Uh, I think it's great that he's having all this success with it um, because I think that this can help a lot of people. Now, I'm trying to be more picky with my 5.0s. So I'm not going to rate it 5.0, okay. but I am going to rate it 4.5 because even for me, someone who had their system already and, you know, I could make the argument that there's nothing new here for me because on one level, a lot of these things I've implemented in different ways, but I still feel like reading through this, Tiago brought a whole bunch of information and kind of filled in a lot of my knowledge gaps. He filled in a lot of the blank spaces with what I thought about these things. So as I think about what, happened to me as a result of reading this book. Like I said, I've got a lot more confidence in the system that I have created. So I think it's a really good book. I would recommend it to absolutely everybody. Uh, if you're looking for something that's going to say, do this exactly in this specific tool, that's not what you're going to get. But if you're okay with that, then it's a, it's a great read. All right, let's put it on the shelf. What's next, Mike? Next is Love and Work by Marcus Buckingham. Uh, we are going to do what we love, Joe. Okay. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> do what you love. Well, following that, I put two in the outline, but I'm going to pick one here. Uh, do the Hard Things First by Scott Allen. Uh, I feel like I, I'm someone who likes to do the easy things first or the fun things first. So I'm curious the thoughts on doing hard things first. It has a lot of reviews and a lot of people who seem to like it. So it seems like it would be a good fit. We'll, we'll give it a shot. Do the Hard Things First by Scott Allen. How about a gap book, Mike? All right, I got one. Okay. Uh, I read Back of the Napkin by Dan Rome, which is a follow-up to the Pencil Pirates course that I was doing, <laughs> communicating yeah. your ideas visually. Uh, I've got a my note file for this one, which I will put up in the club, which by the way, if you haven't checked that recently, I dumped a whole bunch of them last week. I was a little bit behind, but uh, it is up to date now. Nice. Nice work. 
Don't have a gap book. Was busy building a treehouse last week, but I have a couple sure, old sure. ones actually that I started one of. I can tell you what it is. So I'm done with it. So okay, it'll be super fine. fun. So I have started one, but I haven't finished it yet. So I'll tell you when it's done. That said, uh, and like Mike mentioned, if you haven't already, join the club, club.bookworm.fm, uh, and specifically club.bookworm.fm slash membership if you want access to all of Mike's mind node files, which he now has updated. Uh, super cool group of people who are there that support us and support the show. Uh, help us keep the lights on. So big thanks to you who have done that. Simple five bucks a month. And... Uh, we're grateful to have you guys on board, especially those of you who have joined us live here today. We got quite a crew in the chat today. So thanks for joining us on the YouTube. Uh, if you're interested in joining us there, I always tweet out a link from the Bookworm Twitter uh, account once we've got that stream scheduled and set up. So if you're interested in joining us live, we'd love to have you here as well. So thanks again, team. All right, if you're reading along with us, which you totally should, then pick up Love and Work by Marcus Buckingham, and we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Okie tay. One hour, 59 minutes, 37 seconds. <laughs> this is close to a record episode, I think. It's fairly fitting, though. Maybe. It's true. It's true. Thanks, Blake. I do have to run. Though. All right. Me too. So, so two weeks. Two weeks. Thanks for joining us today, team. All right. I expect all your thoughts in social media somehow when this releases. Oh, that rem oh, that reminds me. I have uh, well, people who are still alive get get this. Okay. Um, I did a sketch note of the uh, of building a second brain. So there you go. Oh, cool. Sweet. <laughs> Oh, that's right. I think I saw this. Yeah. Yep. Super fun. All right. We're going to go. Bye, team. Thanks for joining us today. See ya.